Good afternoon from New York, everyone. It's a beautiful day here and good evening to all of you watching from uh, joining us from the Czech Republic and the UK and in other parts of the world. My name is M. Solarova. I'm the program manager here at Czech Center New York and it is my great pleasure to be here with you today. I am so thrilled today because we are quite literally bridging the Atlantic as well as the English Channel thanks to our partnership with the Czech Central London to bring you this event. I'd also like to thank the publishers of these books. It is the World Editions for the Movement and Amazon Crossing for Goethe for making this all possible, quite literally. Two of our guests today are joining us from the Czech Republic, while two of them are here with me in New York, although not literally with me in this room, as we are all together thanks to the powers of technology. Uh, joining us today are Petra Hulova and Alex Zucker, the author and translator, respectively, of the movement, and Veronique Firkušny and Katarina Tučková, the translator and author, respectively, for Gerta. Um, you can read their full bios on our website as they are quite accomplished. And I don't, I don't want to take up too much of our precious time with them, but also, I would definitely encourage you to read up on that as they are quite incredible and we are so thrilled to have them here with us today. I'm also going to put links to buy their books in the chat if you haven't had a chance to read them. I think today's event will definitely encourage you to do so. And now I'd like to turn it over to the speakers. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar names, faces. And uh, my name is Alex Zucker, I uh, translate from Czech. And um, uh, before we get into the program here, I wanted to thank uh, Miroslav Konvalina, the director of the Czech Center in New York, and M. Solarova, who you just met, the program director, of program manager of Czech Center in New York for making this event possible offering the space for us to hold the event and to the thanks to the Czech Center London for co-sponsoring. So um, with that, uh, we're going to get right into the program just to give you a, a, a sense of what's going to happen um, this afternoon or this evening. We're going to have uh, we're going to do some readings in both Czech and English from both of the novels. Uh, then we're going to have a conversation, authors, translators, and then we're going to open it up or questions from all of you. So uh, without further ado, I am going to, we're going to read first Petra Hulova, the author of the movement, and I are going to read a short excerpt from that novel, which was just published in English in the US this week and will be published in the UK uh, November 4th. So I will now turn it over to Petra. And I'm assuming since you signed up for the event, you read what the book was about because it's on the page. I'm keeping the intros to a minimum because we have a short time together today. So, Petra, I will turn it over to you to start the reading. Sorry, Petra, you are muted. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, um, I'll just say that uh, for, for the introduction that um, the book, I think, was well wrapped up uh, by one of its uh, reviews where it's described like a, a feminist manifesto and a critique uh, at the same time. Sedí se v kruhu. Klienti jsou nazí, teplákovku mají složenou v komínku. Já jsem ve svém obvyklém bledě-modrém pytlovitém oblečení, šedivém po tolikerém steprání a nejdřív se klienty snažím uvolnit fyzicky, třepe se nohama a rukama se krouží čajový šálek a zbývá i chvíle pro nezávazný rozhovor. 
Klienty se přesně formulovanými dotazy snažím přimět k tomu, aby svými vlastními slovy vyjádřili, co je na ženách přitahuje a většina hlásí inteligence, dobrota, humor, jistý charakter a spolehlivost. V instituci se nacházejí, protože jen blafují naučenými frázemi. A menšina hlásí krása a mládí, ti dojemní ve své upřímnosti nebo naprostá paka. A pár jich proaktivně rovnou takhle popisuje ženskost. Po úvodu následuje fáze dvě neboli zkušebna. Klienti o ní předem vědí z materiálů, které obdrželi při příjmu, tlustá složka s logem instituce, kterou se pak ve své ložnici týdny probírají, ale vzhledem k tomu, že všechny účastníky kurzů váže povinnost mlčení, praktická podoba zkušebny je pro všechny překvapením a celé to zahajují standardně o ta obrázky. Na stěnu promítám fotografie po starosvětsku vyzývavých nahých žen. Obrázky pouštím na stěnu jeden za druhým v intervalu 30 vteřin a ve chvíli, kdy místností proběhne překvapené zahučení, nabádám k naprostému uvolnění. Jen v takovém rozpoložení se věci vyjevují takové, jaké skutečně jsou. A přestože své volné porno je v instituci stíháno těmi nejtvrdšími tresty, v takto řízené podobě nám slouží jako vstupní výukový materiál. Protože ačkoliv ona skupina nahých mužů již leco za těch pár úvodních dnů v instituci zažila, skutečná převýchova začíná nyní. Thank you, Petra. And I will now um, do a slightly longer reading in English, starting from the same point where Petra began. The clients sit in a circle, naked tracksuits folded in a stack, while I'm in my usual baggy pale blue outfit, gray from so many washings. I start by having them loosen up physically, shaking out their legs and doing the teacup rotation with their arms, and also leave a little time for casual conversation. Then, using precisely formulated questions, I ask the clients to express in their own words what it is that they find attractive in a woman. The majority, who only regurgitate what they've been taught, say intelligence, kindness, a sense of humor, integrity, and dependableness. A minority, touchingly sincere or total morons, say beauty and youth. And a few proactively just straight out describe the qualities that make a woman a woman. After the introduction comes phase two, also known as rehearsal studio. Assuming they've read the materials they were given on being admitted, a thick folder with the Institute's logo, which they pour over in their dorm rooms for weeks. The clients know this is coming, but given that everyone who passes through the course is bound by an oath of silence, the actual contents of rehearsal studio come as a surprise. And I start the whole thing off as usual with pictures. Photographs of naked women alluring in an old world way projected on the wall. I rotate through them one by one at 30 second intervals And as a roar of surprise erupts in the room, I urge the men to relax. Only in this frame of mind can things be revealed for what they truly are. And though our clients are subjected to harsh punishments for unauthorized use of pornography, in a controlled form such as this, it can serve as entry-level instructional material. Because while this group of naked men have already been through a thing or two in their first few days at the Institute, This is the moment when their re-education starts for real. Everything up to this point has been a warm up, gentlemen, I say. I observe the men closely as their initial confusion on being confronted with pornographic photos quickly gives way to a string of erections, each one acting as a trigger for the next. In a few minutes, nearly every man in the room is hard. The whole thing happens so fast, I barely have time to enter it in their individual charts. For the sake of completeness, we define erection as, quote, the penis in a state of readiness for application of a condom, unquote. Once the atmosphere is sufficiently relaxed and the clients feel at home in the new setting, I make a racy joke or two about condoms and then we get down to business. I switch the projector to a new set of photos. Now, instead of smiling girls with large breasts and shapely bottoms, a succession of older women's bodies goes parading past. No retouching or any sort of old world synthetic enhancement. No skin smoothening, hip narrowing, breast enlargement. And even without turning to look, 
I can tell the new loop isn't nearly as popular and the men are disappointed. I hear grumbling behind my back as I adjust the focus to make the images as sharp as possible because the key is in the details. The old women's figures are models of ampleness compared to the ones before them. Swollen breasts, wrinkled skin, rolls of fat. And when I turn up the lights, even the clients with weak eyesight can clearly see that the hair they thought was platinum blonde is actually gray. Next come the shots of women with gray pubic hair. And I observe the clients from the front again, taking note of whose erection fades and how quickly. And as a handful of men sit with their members completely shriveled, I roar, shame, at the top of my lungs, and a deathly silence falls over the room. Now comes phase four. The men are in shock, and that's what we build on. They're disgusted. They feel deceived and made fools of. Instead of talking about what's going on with their bodies, they want to theorize about the Institute's methods. They try to dispute, but all their arguments are biological drivel. So after allowing them to blow off steam a while, I shout, do you eat with your hands at home? It's a rhetorical question, so you know what their answer will be. And if I wanted, at this point, I could take advantage of my ideological superiority and launch into a monologue on civilization and how completely unnatural it is. Instead of eating naturally with our hands and naturally allowing people with disabilities to die, instead of naturally chasing down thieves with a knife, and naturally leaving elderly and unproductive members of society to fend for themselves, we willingly cultivate ourselves to be humane in opposition to our natural tendencies. And we're right to be proud of that. Yes, it goes against nature, I proclaim. I have their attention more than I did a moment ago, since half the clients think I'm confirming their beliefs, while the other half are wondering what I'm up to. Your shriveled cocks are a punch in the eye to European humanity, I roar. That's the end of the excerpt. And I will now pass it over to Veronique. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Petra. And again, just I'm Veronique for Kushni, and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. And I'm grateful that Katarina can join us. Um, I'm going to ask Katarina to read first. This is from Goethe, which is a work of historical fiction that came out in January of 2021, so not quite as hot off the press as the movement. But um, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Katarina to start, and then I will read the same excerpt and a little bit more in English. Okay, thank you, Veronique. Hello, everybody. Uh, at first, I would like to say just a few words uh, about the prologue because we will read uh, from the prologue and I would like you to know where we exactly are. We are in the year 1945 uh, in May and um, in, uh, we are in the moment when Gertha, the main character of the novel, is, uh, was hauled from her home and, uh, and um, forced to leave the city. She was... Uh, Czech German woman, 20 years old, with her half year old baby. And uh, she was, um, because of her nationality, she was uh, uh, thought she's guilty for all the things which happened during the war. And now she is uh, going out of the city, no one knows where. So, Gerta. <clears throat> Hrubá silnice se vkraje drolí do příkopu. Tráva prorůstá štěrkem, přes kameny nadskakují kola dětského kočáru. Levá noha jí před chvílí sjela po kluském štěrku, kotník tupě bolí, zřejmě si natáhla šlachu, snaží se na chodilo nepřenášet plnou váhu. Už několik hodin jdou pomalu, jen se plouží, z kočáry těsně u sebe, čas od času se podpírají, střídají se v tlačení. Na cestu už dlouho není pořádně vidět. Jen chvílemi k ním dosáhne světlo z baterek nebo reflektorů nákladních aut, ale to se ještě těsněji přitisknou, zrychlí krok a kabátem přehozeným přes kočár zavalí děti. Nedokáže přesně odhadnout, jak dlouho už jdou, jako by jejich cesta trvala věky. Přitom se ještě ani nerozednilo, takže to nemůže být víc než několik hodin. Je unavená a její společnice také. Má zkusit zastavit se a odpočnout si. Několikrát procházeli kolem lidí sedících na zemi nebo na kufru, se kterým se vláčeli. 
několikrát také viděli, jak k takovým přiběhl mladík a rozbil jim hlavu pažbou pušky. Měla strach se zastavit. I přes bolest v příslech a v levé noze se nutila k dalším krokům. Dívka vedle ní šeptala o žízni. Gerta nic neřekla. Měla vodu schovanou pro sebe a pro dítě, nemohla nabízet, když nevěděla, co ji ještě čeká. I ona měla žízeň, ale mlčela a dál se sunula krok za, krok, za krokem, Bůh ví kam. Thank you, Katka. Uh, so I will now read from the prologue in English. The edges of the rough road crumble into the ditch. Grass grows through the gravel and the wheels of the baby carriage bump over the stones. Her left foot has just slipped on the loose pebbles. There's a dull throbbing in her ankle. Perhaps she's pulled a tendon. She tries to avoid putting her full weight on the foot. For several hours now, they've been walking slowly, shuffling along their baby carriages side by side. From time to time, they steady each other, take turns pushing. For a long while, it's been impossible to make out the road clearly. Only every so often do the beams of a flashlight or the headlights of a truck sweep over them, but then they huddle even tighter, hasten their steps, and throw their coats over the carriages to cover the children. She can't tell for certain how long they've been walking. It seems as though their journey has taken ages, and yet dawn hasn't even broken, so it can't have been more than a few hours. She's tired, and so is her companion. Should she try to stop and rest? A few times they have passed people sitting either on the ground or on the suitcases they have been dragging along. Several times they have also seen one of the armed youths rush over and bash in these people's heads with the butt of a rifle. She was scared to stop. In spite of the stitch in her side and the pain in her left foot, she forced herself to keep taking steps. The young mother walking beside her was whispering about being thirsty. Gerta said nothing. She had hidden away some water for herself and her child, but she couldn't offer any, not knowing what still lay ahead. Although she too was thirsty, she remained silent and shuffled along, step by step, only God knew to where. God? She had lost faith in him long ago. Once upon a time, she had prayed to him, begged him to help her to do something, anything that would have changed her life. Then, little by little, she realized that God wasn't about to do a thing for her. But by then, it was too late. From that moment on, she had stopped praying and didn't think about God anymore. She wanted to be self-sufficient, even at times like this, because God had no idea where they were driving her. Only those crazed schoolboys knew, and maybe in the end, not even they. Those harebrained brats, she choked with rage. Their voices would reach her and then disappear again, becoming lost in the cries of the people ahead of her. A few times she caught a glimpse of them, riding in the backs of passing trucks. With their upraised, tangled weapons, they reminded her of Medusa and her twisted hair of snakes. A seething, raging Medusa, a murderess with the sinister, drunken maw of vulgar riffraff. Look upon them and you would die. You would turn to stone or they would shoot you. She hated them, but that was all she could do. Only hate and above all, not let it show if she wanted to survive. She walked meekly beside her companion and kept her mouth shut. The night was inching toward a gray morning and ahead of her stretched a column of quiet, exhausted people. The sounds of their steps, the swish of winter coats, and words uttered in low voices were interrupted only by the shouts of the guards, the moans of the wounded, and occasional gunshots. How many? Gerta could no longer keep count. Where exactly had this nightmare started? By the time the flowers had fallen to the bottom of her mother's open grave, everyone was already sensing it as if they already knew. Even her father was getting anxious, although he still blindly believed. When Gerta shot him a sidelong glance, she saw how he was holding himself together, how he was clenching all the muscles in his face, keeping his eyes fixed and then hiding them behind a profusion of blinking, how hard he was trying not to cry. 
But he should cry, thought Goethe, he should. He should smear the top of his bald head from which the last wisps of fair hair were receding with the earth from her mother's grave. He should rub the earth onto his face, let it mix with his tears and above all cry for forgiveness. That he should do, not stand there preening in his uniform like a pigeon on a perch with his chest puffed out, watching her mother's coffin disappear under clods of dirt. Stop, Goethe wanted to cry out, but Friedrich held her back. He grabbed her arm so abruptly it startled her. Was Friedrich not crying either? But of course, how could he faithful image of his father that he was? Goethe looked again into the deep hole, where by now the dark gray of the coffin was showing through only in spots. It had been a modest funeral, but this, after all, was not where it had started. This funeral was just one link in a chain of calamities that had come month by month, year after year, all through the war. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, Alex, I'm going to invite you back to unmute yourself. Um, I thought you, you were going to start that. out the questions for the authors. I, I am happy to do that. Um, okay. So my, my one question that uh, I'm going to start by asking Katarina um, is, have you noticed a, a difference in the way readers reacted to your book when it came out in the Czech Republic compared to in translation? <clears throat> So uh, it uh, it were very different opinions on my book in Czech country. There was no one general um, uh, review or, or point of view of my book because everybody had a very different uh, opinion about the uh, whole circumstances of expulsion of expulsion of German citizens from Czechoslovakia. So in Czech Republic, it was sometimes uh, uh, well accepted because I opened the topic which wasn't discussed before, but sometimes it was uh, very uh, um, accepted very badly, um, let's say in the part of uh, Czech, Czech Republic around the borders where uh, this uh, topic is still very vivid, lively because of the property and uh, the closeness to German borders. Um, so it is the Czech uh, reception uh, and abroad um, it was quite different in Germany because there still live a lot of people who were um, who are um, who are uh, sons and daughters or grand grandchildren of uh, expelled people and who um, who have uh, uh, the memory of expulsion in their families. Uh, there were three and a half millions of uh, Germans in Czechoslovakia before the end of the war, so it's a it's a it's a big amount. And then uh, different uh, opinions were in, in other countries, but uh, it's um, uh, generally it's possible to say that uh, in uh, in uh, East uh, Europe, uh, where uh, German minorities lived, they were they had uh, the the question from the audience or the discussion after the readings was, was the same usually about the guilt, about the revenge, about the uh, first, second and third generation um, uh, reconciliation with the expulsion or with the, with, and, and about the memories of uh, the original home. I'm muting myself, a, a lot more personal reaction. I, I wanted to ask the same question of Petra, and I realized that since your book, The Movement, has only now come out in English, it's a bit early to, to ask you about reader reactions to that. But your previous book, Three Plastic Rooms, also dealt with a, a similar topic, sort of sexuality and ideas that could be you know, thought considered feminist. Um, I wanted to ask you the same question. What was the difference? Was there a difference in the reaction that Czech readers had to your original um, Czech version and how other translations uh, were re reacted to? Thank you. 
Thank you for the question. I think I can directly talk about the movement because even though it was released uh, recently, uh, there have been already quite some uh, reviews in the English speaking uh, medias. Uh, well, in, in Czech Republic, the critical reaction was rather uh, confused. Uh, because, uh, as I mentioned, the the text is as if both uh, manifesto and and critique. So, in the reviews, uh, that was uh, questioned often in the way that uh, reviewers asked whether um, the author was a feminist or was anti-feminist, uh, what was the, the perspective of the book. So uh, that was quite a frequent uh, subtext of the, of the reviews. Uh, whereas in the, in the American uh, press, American uh, websites and, and, and uh, English speaking websites, uh, the, uh, the reflection of it was rather as if um, unproblematic or it was more considered as, a, as an asset or something um, noteworthy and, and interesting. But for uh, Czech uh, reviewers, the same thing was um, more of a, of a problem and the question of where the author's own, um, what the author's position is and what her perspective is was uh, permanent. Yeah, so that was the, the greatest difference. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so the next question um, also for both authors, um, I guess we'll continue with you, Petra, and then over to you, Katarzyna, which um, is, I know it's a question that you've both answered a lot, but still I think um, interesting and and useful for readers and people attending this event to know what led you to write this novel, because you've both written multiple novels and they're not always all about the same thing. So what, what spurred you or what led you to write this particular book? So Petra? Uh, thank you. Well, um, what I might uh, say is that uh, before this book, I wrote, uh, a manuscript of about 300 pages with the same uh, topic uh, of a feminist movement that uh, takes over the European space and, uh, and, and, and becomes very, very powerful and, uh, and as, the, as if a new uh, cultural mainstream. And the whole manuscript ends with the creation of these uh, re-educational institutions for men. And uh, the narrator of the book uh, is, a, is a man, leader of the, of, the, of the movement. And in the end, he sends his best friend to this re-educational institution. So that's how, how this book, how this never, never, it was never published, uh, how this manuscript ended. And then I was like, well, okay, uh, but what I'm really interested in is what's going on in these re-educational institutions. So I, I uh, had to start from very scratch and I ended up with this uh, novel, which was published. Um, that's not really the answer, but what I may add also is this little, um, situation with my uh, daughter. We were walking uh, the city some years ago and there was this uh, billboard with a lady in bikini um, advertisement on cars or yogurts or whatever. As we know, um, naked um, ladies are being used uh, for. And, um, and my five-year-old daughter asked me this question why is uh, the lady naked mom. And that was for me very strong moment. And uh, I, uh, I really wanted to somehow, uh, it just somehow uh, triggered uh, spark for me. One of, one, of, one of the sparks in general, questions of um, feminism or 
women emancipation and 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 all that is something that that I find as a permanent topic um, in my books. Thank you, Petra. And then Katarzyna, so you've said that this is a controversial subject in Czech Republic and former Czechoslovakia, of course, right? The um, the wildcat ex expulsion of um, German community in uh, Czechoslovakia. So what led you to write uh, Gerta? Actually, it was a coincidence. Um, it was around the year 2002 when I moved to the district uh, in Brno, which is called Bronx. Uh, it's uh, considered like a dark uh, district with high criminality. No one wants to live there, but there were um, cheap flats and I can, uh, I could afford it uh, as a university student. So I moved there and uh, I found it very strange, the district, because uh, it was just 10 minutes far away from the city center there uh, until now they are they are uh, nice buildings um, it, it, it's visible that it was uh, um, quite a wealthy part of the city in the past not 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 the most uh, beautiful part of the city but quite good uh, district and um, i felt that uh, there had to happen something uh, uh, something weird uh, and uh, because it is in the state uh, how it is now and I started to um, make a research to ask people. There were no uh, people who originally came from the district. Uh, everybody were new there, uh, no old citizens. Uh, it was also weird. So um, after some time when I made the research, I found down the strange history of this district uh, that it was the uh, district where uh, Jews, German, Czechs lived together until the 40s when uh, Jew community were uh, transferred to concentration camps. Then in the 1945, German community were expelled from the city, never returned. And uh, in 60s and 70s, uh, Czech uh, citizens uh, moved out from this already weird part of the city to uh, new uh, new um, suburbs and um, the, the the place totally lost its memory and um, uh, what was uh, in interesting for me is that um, such a situation uh, happened in Brno because we never learned about it in the school in high school or in university and uh, so the expulsion of German the expulsion of transfer of Jews it was the topic, Holocaust was the topic, but, but uh, no one knows uh, that uh, in Brno lived almost 25% 25, 25 of uh, Germans with, uh, with, uh, or, or Czech citizens of German origins. So um, such a taboo shocked me and I wanted to know more about it. And when I found out that uh, in the um, march um, of people who were expelled uh, in wild uh, expulsion was also, a girl, 20 years old, we have old uh, half year old baby, uh, which uh, and they lived in in my uh, street. Uh, they were um, both, I mean, Gerta and her child, uh, um, half Czech, half German. I felt um, very close to her because I was the same age and. Uh, uh, I really wanted to give her voice to speak for her and uh, offer to reader not only the facts, but also the emotion, how people like her, who were too young to uh, be um, to share the, the, the guilt on the war conflict, uh, how they suffered because they were true victims. So I started to write about Gerta. Thank you so much. And um, back over to Veronique. I believe we're gonna ask one, one more question of the authors, yeah? Yes. Um, so again, I'd like to turn the floor over to Petra and Petra, start with you. I know, as Alex said, you've both written multiple novels and they've been translated into multiple languages. I wanted to ask if being translated has influenced how you write? Has it had an impact on your own writing? Petra, if we could start with you. Um, 
Well, um, I don't think it has affected my um, writing. Um, I, what I um, what might have affected me is um, is the critical response, which is really um, different uh, abroad, and uh, and gives me a wider perspective of, of on my um, own um, work. Um, well, um, usually, uh, it often often happens that in the in the Czech Republic. Everybody knows everybody, so also the reviews are often uh, or can be often can be sometimes like personal and uh, and um, not really um, well. Objective is might be not the right word, but definitely uh, the reviews are tinted by the fact that it's like very small here and, and everybody has its own authors he or she likes and, and, and he or she dislikes. Whereas um, abroad, uh, no one really knows me personally and no one really follows me personally. So it's, it's really more just about the text so uh, that's something very uh, valuable um, for me. And then um, what is very interesting is the cooperation with uh, translators. Well, sometimes I don't cooperate much. Uh, sometimes translators uh, very um, independent um, or just does not want to consult. Sometimes I work in close cooperation and uh, for example with Alex Zucker it's always a uh, pleasure to work together because also um, translator and 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 Alex especially um, just uh, uh, through through his misunderstanding I have to uh, clarify uh, to myself um, what um, what sometimes is really what I what I want to say and what what is um, what I just write without um, without reasoning because you don't have to think so much when you write but you you have to really understand when you translate so then uh, it triggers interesting reflection and discussion. Thank you. It's a really interesting answer. Thank you, Petra. And now, Katarina, if I could ask you the same question, how has being translated, has being translated into other languages affected the way in which you write or how has it influenced you as a writer? I don't, uh, that it influenced me. Uh, at, uh, I, I don't think that it influenced me. Um, during the writing, I'm always uh, fighting with, with uh, the story, the plot, the characters. I focus on my own uh, relationship with the characters on the topic which interests me. And I think that I uh, don't think much about the reader and uh, I mean Czech reader and uh, about the foreign reader. No, I'm sorry, but uh, it comes in the second uh, second level of the process and third level of the process. So the second one is the editing process when the editor asks me uh, some questions and I, I, I have to change something to be more uh, more um, understandable for the reader because sometimes uh, I, I I'm deep in my thoughts and don't think about the readers so there are there is this large space for corrections and another um, reflection comes usually from the uh, from the translators because uh, sometimes like uh, things from uh, from Czech past are not uh, understandable for foreign writers, uh, foreign readers. So uh, there are uh, there comes some questions uh, and or information how how the foreign translator um, which changes made or which information he had to or she had to give into the text to be understandable for 
for for the foreign reader. So um, I should think more about the reader, but unfortunately, during the first part, first level of the process, I'm very selfish and just focus on the topic. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting to get into both of your heads. And um, I think that 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 is my question. Alex, I do have a question for you. <laughs> As the translator, I don't know, am I am I breaking our order? <laughs> Is it your turn? What I wanted to ask you was, when you have worked with Petra now, this the movement is your third collaboration, and I was just wondering how you how your collaboration began. How did you find each other? I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the whole beginnings of that relationship? Yes, thanks for the question. So um, I think Petra and I both are the same in that we don't remember exactly when we first met, right? Um, but it was, um, I, I can't remember, was it in Prague or in New York that yeah, we actually first, in New York. Okay, so Petra, <laughs> Petra came to New York City on a, a Fulbright Fellowship, correct? Yeah, um, when uh, she was still doing uh, Mongolian studies or cultural studies with a focus on Mongolia. And um, I guess um, um, but so I translated your first novel before we met. Well, um, I I, I think I I heard a lot about you already in in Prague from uh, Yahim Topol, whom texts you translated, uh, or definitely the Silver Sister, uh, and so uh, I heard about you from him as a great translator, and and then later we met personally in in New York, but uh, I also don't have a clear memory of our first <laughs> encounter. Yeah, so- but the, um, fame, but the fame of you was definitely before okay. that moment. <laughs> so, um, and as for the actual, like the work, the, the, the literary work, um, uh, so there's a person named Edgar de Bruin, who is a translator from Czech into Dutch, who also uh, acts as agent for um, quite a few Czech writers. And he was at the time representing Petra. And so he sold her first uh, novel in Czech uh, called Pamiet uh, Moji to, Babičce, um, which was published in, um, what year was that? 2000, 2002. 2002. Two. He sold it to Northwestern University Press and um, I guess recommended me as a translator. And that was the first book of Petra's that I translated. So that was when our, our professional collaboration began. Um, and um, yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, we just kept in, in touch from there. I continued to read. Petra's work and um, continue to work with Edgar, who I, I continue to work with him on a number of authors. Uh, we don't sell every book, you know, but um, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it's just, it's so interesting within that world, you know, how, how things begin and how, how people find each other. But I'm just, it, I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing, I've been seeing these wonderful questions coming through on chat. I, I know we had a lot of other questions that we were going to, to talks to each other about but I'm just wondering if um if maybe we should take a pause and see what what people want to hear about I just don't want to miss an opportunity what do you think um well I think we we have an opportunity to go a little bit over if needed so uh, in the interest of of uh parity and fairness I want to put a question back to you okay um, translator to translator, because, um, you know, reading Gerta, it's clear. I, I, I don't know how many readers um, have a grasp of just how much research goes into a literary translation, even when it's not a historical novel that involves, you know, actual events, places, people. So um, 
I'd like to take this opportunity to uplift that and specifically to ask you, um, you know, what, 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 I imagine this novel must have taken more than the usual amount of research. Um, and if you could talk a little about what you, the kind of research that you did um, for this translation and, and even some examples, if, if you have any. Well, it, it definitely, first of all, as a work of historical fiction, there was an awful lot of history that was new for me as well. In when I, that was one of the things that captivated me so much about Goethe because it talked about a, a, a familiar period of history, but in an entirely new way and from a very different perspective than anything I'd ever been exposed to. And I, I don't know how I would have done it had I not had the internet, honestly, because there is there were so many, um, you know, for example, just there's a certain period of the novel that deals with post-liberation politics as they were emerging, as the Communist Party was organizing itself, as it was finding its way. Um, there were a lot of details about that process that I, I really didn't know much about. And I ended up finding myself, you know, referring to a lot of Czech texts and a lot of um, things come, would come up in very strange ways with repeated Googling. It helped definitely for this novel, especially to also be familiar with German because there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of incidents that in order for me to get a real understanding, I found myself also reading some of the German, um, you know, articles or, or pieces that had been written about the expulsion. Um, the other thing that was, that was interesting was there are certain um, parts of the book. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, there's a scene where Goethe, right after the liberation, where Goethe goes to a square, you know, wrapped up incognito to hear Benesch make a speech. And this is a very, very um, well-known speech that is referenced often, but I, I kept trying to see if there was an existing official translation of it, since it in fact was something that had happened. And, um, and, I, and I, I ended up, you know, not finding an exact translation. So it, it was an interesting process. That's one example. There are other examples, like for instance, there's the, the voice of Levitan, the Russian radio personality whose voice sort of fills the streets of Brno with uh, an announcement basically saying, you know, the giving and giving details on where the military movements are. And part of that I did find quoted. So it was, a, it, in that sense, it was, it was um, a fascinating process of, of, you know, figuring out where to pull what from and and what needed to be retran what needed to be translated what might already have existed in an official version and i also want to say that what was invaluable was the ability to reach out to katarina i would sort of keep a list of notes and um and you know would would email her if i came across things that i wasn't clear on or that that i wasn't sure i understood correctly um, the other thing that helped me a great deal was there had been a German translation of this book that had come out not that long before I started working on the English translation, and that was also really helpful. Katarina talked about how certain things that a Czech reader would know immediately references that would be very, you know, understandable. The German translation helped me by sort of indicating where something maybe needed a little bit more explanation. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think that's great. And I'm sure, as you said, that there are other examples. Um, but the, the Benesch, um, I was wondering if there was an official translation of that speech already. That was one. Of I the never things. found it. Yeah. So I guess at, at this point, we can turn it back over to M for uh, some questions from um, uh, the audience that have come in. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much for the discussion. That's been, this has been so insightful. Um, so for anyone in the audience, if you have other questions, feel free to type them into the chat. And also let me know if you'd like to ask yourself on camera or if you'd prefer 
for me to read the question. So our quest first question from the audience is for Katarzyna, and it's after your book came out, what was the attitude of the Czech people towards this lost history and has anything changed? Uh, maybe I didn't understand. Maybe it is written here uh, some somewhere here. What was the attitude of Czech audience? And then it continues. How, how if it if it changed? If anything changed? Maybe you know with your book if it made them see the other side or you know something. Okay, like I, that. See, I see. Yeah. So the book was published in the year two thousand nine, and uh, at that time it wasn't um, totally new topic. So um, when I uh, read or discussed the topic somewhere, uh, then uh, people had uh, there's some quite uh, quite tough opinions, positive or both positive and negative. When a negative, uh, it's uh, always was focus on the on the guilt of Germans. Uh, but I think that uh, there were uh, there it wasn't such a black and white. There were some uh, injuries, harm from from the war, which uh, which uh, lasted until the third generation. Definitely, then there was a fear for for property um, around the borders with Germany, especially we call this part of the city. Sudetenland, and there was uh, the quite uh, so there was the most negative uh, attitude towards the uh, toward the Gerta to, toward the, um, to my book. So uh, um, there were a lot of topics, but during the year uh, when I traveled with the book and discussed the, the topic, then I found down that uh, people feel. Um, uh, less uh, obsessed and less scared and uh, less negative. Maybe uh, it was because uh, there were uh, not only my book, but also a documentary uh, series, also theater plays. The topic was uh, was lively in in the after the year, let's say uh, 2010. And uh, finally, a um, couple of years after. My book was published. Uh, we, together with my friends in Brno, we asked the city um, if there don't, uh, if if there would be so good to reconsider the whole topic. And uh, in the year 2015, finally, the the city council was so um, uh, willing and. Uh, let's say also educated, they knew more about the topic that finally they um, really seriously said sorry for the victims who died during the death march. It was totally surprising, uh, totally wonderful. The, the meeting when the official sorry uh, apologize was said, was, um, uh, was visited by thousands of people and it was quite a big thing in Brno. So I can see that things change during the time when I'm uh, dealing with this topic. And it's, uh, I think, very good uh, information for all of us. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes uh, for Petra, actually. And the question is about your novels, Stanice Taiga, Strážci občanského dobra, and Stručné dějiny hnutí. They all contain prominent elements of misguided utopia. Would it be fair to say that you have an abiding interest in utopian thinking, or did the impulse to write each of these books come from a very different place? Well, uh, it's, it's for me a little bit difficult to put these three novels in the same pot, uh, even though, I can see some similarities there, uh, but I would say they they all deal with the topic of society or ideological background is always lurking behind the human stories of the characters there. So. Uh, that it is not just, uh, it's not depicting just like private lives, but operates within a wider scope of society. That, that's something they have in common. Um, well, um, Utopia in the case of Station Taiga, 
I'm not sure. Uh, well, I would say that Station Taiga is a is a, um, me looking for an answer. Um, well, I was fascinated by a story of a human being that leaves a place and disappears and no one knows what what happened to that person so that was what was leading leading me in the in that novel whereas in the uh, guardians of public good it's more about uh, young enthusiastic communist devotee it was written in the 2010 when by that time in the Czech, Czech Republic, we had a lot of stories of uh, anti-communist outsiders who uh, were like celebrating the victory of democracy in 1990. Uh, and, com and, and, and communism in general was just that, uh, Evil, uh, evil ideology um, with like no um, lighter aspects. Whereas I'm empathizing here with this girl that uh, as if uh, regrets what came with the democratic change uh, of Velvet Revolution and she, um, she emphasizes negative aspects that were brought in with capitalism and kinds of it, it, it at that time it was very provocative and again these questions of critics in the czech press were all about uh, me as an author being a communist or anti-communist or what what did what did i wanted to to convey uh but I, I wanted to provoke thinking and 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 uh, push uh, the reader out of uh, out of his comfort zone and that's probably something that I can see as a link with the movement where also uh it's not about uh myself being feminist or being anti-feminist but more about a uh, shift of a perspective and um, and kind of a new sensitivity or um, what happens if we step out of our usual perspective and, and, and get into this uncomfortable zone where we have to question certain things. And that that's something I would say links my texts in general, this attempt to shift the reader out of his or her comfort zone and and provoke. I, I love to provoke. That's great. I thank you for that answer. I think that's so insightful that your you seem to get reviews based on what they think about your views and not not the actual book. So Thank you for expanding on that. I really enjoyed that answer. Uh, the next question comes from our audience and it's actually for our translators, but I think it's possibly for all four of you. Uh, the question from Victoria is, both texts are similar to Bildungsroman or at least tales of growing up through frustration. This genre has a lot of, has a long tradition in both Czech and world literature. literature. For example, I thought about Rachel Seifert's Dark Room when I read Gertha. How could translators, how could authors and their translators build their texts in such a literary context? Are translations influenced by possible literary associations? I'm happy to take the first stab at that. Um, the short answer is yes, of course, translations are influenced by possible literary associations. But I'm not sure it's um, straightforward. Um, you know, I will say this is a this is a, a great question. It's also a very big question. So, and there are four of us. So, I'm going to give a an answer that isn't necessarily my full answer, just 
for the record, but I will say that I can tell you that when I read a book, a Czech novel, um, before I translate it and, and then, you know, not knowing that I'm going to translate it yet, and then I read it when I know that I'm going to translate it yet, there are, of course, associations that's, that come to mind for me, both from other books I've read in Czech and books that I've read uh, in English, which may or may not have been written in English originally. They could be other translations, right? But then, so those associations are in my mind. But then when I'm actually writing the translation, right, the text is, I think, unavoidably going to, like, I don't know what, what it's going to be like to translate the text until I translate it. It's never this, it's never really, I think other translators feel the same. It's never quite the same when you sit down and you're actually writing it as when you, what you think it's going to be. And so, how can I put this? Words happen <laughs> and they come into association with each other. There are different associations in English that come up as you write a sentence or a paragraph or a character or you know a novel that you can't necessarily forecast. And so, although Petra is correct, my translation is very different from her um, novel in the sense that you know I, I'm following her her novel, so I'm not just. I can't just write whatever comes to mind. There are certain words which will call to mind other words, right? Or other structures of sentences that can be associated with other things that were written either in English originally or not. So I, I think that those associations just organically, I would say, or almost automatically and unconsciously spring up as I write the translation, but they're not the same associations that come to mind when I'm reading the book before I translate it. Just, just stick with the translators. I, I, um, I agree so much, Alex, with what you said. And for me, the process is very much, you know, reading a text for the, for just reading it is a very different experience than sitting down and actually starting the process of translating it. And I think anyone who, who is so inclined would, would marvel if they did a simple exercise, take one sentence that you see on a billboard, on an advertisement that you come across and try and translate it into another language or from another language into English. It is unbelievable how how complex that process actually is, even if it's a simple sentence, because there are, you know, there are nuances, there are vocabulary choices, there's a register that you, at least I, when I go into a text, I, I really feel that it is the text that inspires my, my word choice. And I try to also be very mindful of the characters that are speaking and who they are, so I, and I don't really think of other, you know, I really immerse, so I don't really consciously think of other associations. Um, although I'm sure that, you know, everything that we read and that we consume as readers in every language is in some way going to Im find its way into our translation process or rewriting process. So that's my con contribution to this answer. Well, uh, shall I answer too? Or shall we as authors answer too? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's just uh, this Bildungsroman thing. Um, I would rather say that the movement is the opposite of Bildungsroman because the main character, she really does not change a lot. Uh, I mean, at all, she keeps being very much the same for uh, during the whole uh, story. And uh, so it's not about like growing up through frustration, but about like staying, uh, keeping being the same, even though there are so many reasons 
to change and that might be rather more like of a frustration for the reader because I believe as a reader you might as if wish or or expect the, the narrator to somehow change her perspective because there are so many impulses in her surrounding that might make her to change, but she just keeps being herself. Uh, so that's just what I wanted to add. Thank you. <clears throat> so probably my turn now. Well, uh, I had a great opportunity to speak with the uh, three free women, free, free women who who survived or experienced the death march from Brno, and uh, it was uh, very important for me to to listen to them, to feel with them what their experience, and also to see how they uh, dealt with the trauma which they. Um, which they uh, suffered like uh, in in for uh, in all three cases like children they were very, very young when they were uh, were uh, forced to leave Brno, and uh, I, I could see how they um, dealt with with the with the trauma due over the years. Uh, some of them were very bitter and never never. Uh, forgive uh, things which happened to them or to their mothers because some of them were a witness, personal witness of uh, raping of their mothers. You can never forget such a thing. Some of them, one of them was uh, totally different. She was so optimistic pers personality that she was able to forgive and settle new life back in Brno when she was able to return. And um, um, the quality of life was totally different uh, from the, the previous cases. I, I saw that uh, there was also because of the big trauma, uh, there was uh, impossibility to communicate about the memories with the second uh, generation because um, a uh, woman with, with, with such an experience, as I mentioned, raping of a mother, she couldn't speak about the German roots and the old German issues with the with the, her daughter. So there was, was a total gap. So I couldn't um, find any examples or I couldn't, uh, couldn't find um, any literature um, um, Zoret's uh, mosaic, how, how to wrote it. I uh, saw it uh, personally and uh, it was totally fascinating how, how this topic uh, went over the years. So here was mentioned the Rachel Seifert's dark, dark Room. It is uh, interesting. Uh, I would like to know more about it. But the, in my case, the, the life itself uh, make the structure of the novel and, and inspired me uh, to write uh, Gerta's Fate and uh, Friends of Gerta's Fate. Thank you, Katarina. Speaking actually about uh, your research and your novel, the next question is for you as well. It's about whether you talked to any of the um, Germans who were expelled or their relatives um, and what touched you the most, most uh, in that sense in your research. Katarina, that question is for you. I don't know if that was clear. Uh, I had some problems with connection, maybe, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't hear the question. But if it is the question about Radka Stenemarkova, peníze od Hitlera, is it is it correct? No, or? actually, it's an earlier question that came through the chat while you were talking a while back. It was about uh, whether you talked to any of the expelled Germans in your research and what touched you the most. Um, in that regard. Yeah, I see. I see. So I spoke uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, women who had a chance to return to Brno and uh, stayed uh, as, as a Czech citizens, uh, Czechoslovakia citizens and, and Czech citizens in Brno. Uh, it was the, the, um, the main source of my, uh, for my, uh, for my, of my research, for my research. 
but uh, there was also published some memories, memoirs, memories, and um, almanac books uh, with with the interviews uh, or, or memories uh, with the people who were expelled. And uh, during my research, I had these uh, sources uh, for for work. For example, the book uh, Deutschen Raus Niemcy Wen, uh, where people who live um, Live, lived at that time on, or live nowadays uh, all over the Germany, gathered their memo memories and uh, described uh, um, almost every minute of the uh, uh, Brno that March. So such a sources I work with and I had also great uh, cooperator in the personality of David uh, Kovařík, who is a historian and uh, helped me very much with um, uh, finding or, or searching for some uh, newspaper articles or, or, or documentary materials. So again, thank to David Kovařík is Gerta, like he, she is, or it is the book. Wonderful, thank you so much for that answer. I'm gonna wrap this up with one last question. You've all been so generous with your time and I wanna thank you, but we are starting to go quite a bit over our original plan. So let me just ask you, um, and this is coming from our director Miroslav Konvalina here at the Czech Center in New York. Uh, he'd like to know what has changed in the last two years. Do you still have direct interactions with your readers in the Czech Republic? And do you miss direct contact with your audiences? Uh, Petra, would you like to answer first? Sorry, I was reading this question in chat. Can you re repeat it for me? Of Thank course. You. The question is about direct contact with your audiences. What has changed for you in the last two years? Do you still have direct contact with your audience and or do you miss it? Uh, yeah, well, last two years were rather without much of a direct contact with most of people. Um, so I, um, I miss it, I do, um, as a lot of us um, missed it. Um, but fortunately, I, I mean, I also realized that what I do um, is a, lonesome job and uh, I uh, I was able to continue working even uh, without any kind of uh, direct uh, contact so um, it was uh, sad and difficult but it didn't prevent me from working at times the other uh, way around but definitely I feel that even though this uh, possibility to gather on the zoom is great uh, there is something that is uh, missing for me uh, because um, what happens via human interaction is just words are just part of it and uh, uh, there is something like uh, emotions and, and atmosphere and all that that is non-transmittable uh, through Zoom and uh, so uh, that I am quite eager to uh, go back to because literature is magical thing and uh, Zoom is only about that. It's it's very very dry. It's very very logical. It's it's very much about the message. Uh, whereas literature is much more than any kind of message. So I I feel uh, uh, hungry for um, face to face interaction with my uh, readers and 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 people in general. I mean as we all have the same feeling, I think. I don't know if I answered the question, but thank you. 
I think you definitely did. Thank you so much, Petra. Katarina, do you have anything you want to say to the question? About audience no. interaction. Sorry, I know your internet's been buggy, but the question was about audience interaction and how that's changed for you in the last two years and whether or not you miss it. Definitely, I miss the, the auto readings and discussion and contact with the audience. Uh, however, I also found something positive about the whole pandemic time because uh, before I traveled really much uh, once or twice per week. And uh, I, I think that I wasn't so much concentrated like I was during the pandemic. I really had time to concentrate on work and it definitely helped to finish my uh, new novel. So there was also something uh, better. And uh, I have to say that I was also prepared because uh, a month because in, in March before the pandemic started or the first lockdown here in Czech Republic started, I gave birth to my son. So I was prepared to calm down and settle more. So for me, maybe it wasn't such a big change uh, and, uh, and the, the process uh, of writing uh, was for me uh, more easy when I uh, hadn't, uh, I, 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 when I uh, can't to travel together with, with uh, my newborn son to some reading festivals and so on, how I was a bit prepared, but still. So also some, something positive was here. I would like to jump in. The reason I asked the question, uh, there is actually a, a reason. Um, uh, as a di director of the Czech Center in New York, I realized that there are new opportunities. Just today, uh, we had uh, several like more intimate contacts with artists. We had a branch with Peter Seas and architect Thomas Bittner came and, and other people are coming. So we realized that the future is to meet and do programs maybe for much smaller groups, but uh, it's much more in intensive. And also, you know, in the United States, uh, we uh, got, uh, especially with this kind of program and with Strapiro program with Andrew Singer, we got to completely different audiences. Um, uh, we were able to introduce Gerta with um, Katerina to uh, the people all over the United States, not only in universities, professors, students, but also there are a lot of Czechs living somewhere in San Diego or North Carolina, far from our embassy and Czech culture center in New York or somewhere. And uh, they're asking us, hey, uh, you know, uh, are there some new books? And, and we want to introduce them to our families and, and what are books in translation? So for us uh, this year, especially uh, working with um, Alex, Veronique and others is a great opportunity to introduce uh, the literature which is on the table right now. So um, I want to end <laughs> with something positive that the new normal actually enlarge the share of the literature programs, at least, uh, in, you know, in the Czech Center New York, which is the gateway of the Czech culture to the United States. So I would like to thank, uh, you know, uh, Katarzyna Petra, especially they found the time for us. And, and, and uh, it's really great that we can work close together with uh, Veronique, uh, Alex Zucker and other translators uh, here in the United States because there is strong group and we are proud that they want to be associated with the Czech Center New York, Czech Center London and Czech Centers at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mirek, and thank you to everyone who, who joined us today. And thank you, Alex, for really spearheading this particular event. Um, it's been so, so informative and such a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you to everybody for being here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, thank you're right. Well, it was lovely. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Um, we look forward to seeing you at another one of our events, hopefully in person, but perhaps online as well. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you.